Good evening and welcome to my channel. Um, yeah, I've started writing quite a few stories again, um, along with everything else. So um, I have another one for you. It's a little bit longer than usual, but not too long. Um, and um, it's set during the French Revolution. A bit of a challenge. And I apologise to any historians out there um, if I've um, included any terrible inaccuracies. Do please leave me a message in the comments. And while you're at it, you might as well subscribe and like and share and do all those lovely things. Um, oh, another reminder, uh, in about six stories time, I will be announcing the winners of the 100, um, Story 100 competition. If you still want to enter, all you need to do is put in the comments three or four or five, no more than five, random words. And I'm going to cut all these words up, uh, put them in a hat, I'm going to draw five out and they will be the words chosen for the hundredth story and everyone whose word contributed to that hundredth story will get a signed copy of my book um, which is called Running Coyote and Fallen Star and it will be out on the 1st of July which means I have to complete um, I guess it probably no it doesn't mean I have to do that but anyway I will send you a copy um, if you are lucky enough to win the competition and there's not that many entries yet, so you know you've got a good chance. Anyway, this is called, uh, sorry, this is based on five random words as ever, and the words are. And the story is called The Oblique Blade. Tombo the executioner had grown to loathe his job. At the start of the revolution as an apprentice killer, he delighted in the spectacle of justice being enacted so finally and so clinically. His erstwhile master, Marcel Duvalier, who had over a thousand heads to his credit, it was said, had been a staunch defender of the oblique blade as a method of dispatch. When a foreign dignitary had dared to suggest that death by guillotine was barbaric, Duvalier had famously retorted, Have you seen the mess you can make of a man's neck with an ill-swung axe? There had been much laughter, and the visiting ambassador had shrunk back into himself, the very epitome of chagrin. Duvalier had made a good point. The blade reliably dispatched an average-sized villain in little more than an instant. There were no more ugly scenes of bodies spasming on the scaffold or jugulars spraying blood into the crowd while a felon attempted to crawl to freedom across a slippery river of his own blood. Even Marie Antoinette had been sent to meet her maker with little more than a whimper and a triumphant roar from the crowd. But lately, Tombeau, reaching his third year as a chief executioner in Aix-en-Provence, where he'd moved with his young family, was growing disillusioned. All this talk of liberté, égalité, fraternité was beginning to ring hollow. Nothing had much improved in the conditions of the ordinary folk. They were still starving in their squalid millions, even here in this quiet and picturesque town surrounded by hills. Last week he'd overseen the executions of 48 co-conspirators who'd apparently been communicating with exiled Parisian Girondin, that no actual evidence of their collusion survived the inspector's investigation, apparently had burnt up in a house fire, was just one more in a series of worrisome events. Was this rooting out of villainy being used to settle personal vendettas, as some of the scurrilous pamphlets in circulation suggested? Was he, Tombeau, a man of integrity, a trained surgeon in a former life, now just another thug working for a different pack of corrupt leaders? There was something he'd never liked about Robespierre, evident on the few occasions their paths had crossed. The man had conviction, for sure, but he also had a vicious glint in his eye. He took far too much delight in the terror he had created. Today, Tombeau had to execute a 63-year-old printer, of all people, accused of working with the Girondins, printing their anti-revolutionary tracts. The man was elderly, seemed confused by his arrest and baffled by the charges laid against him. Tombeau suspected he was scheduled to be guillotined as a warning against others aiding the forces arrayed against the mission to liberate France from its decadent ruling classes. Get him out, won't you? The sun's overhead and the day's fast wasting. He found himself shouting as he entered the jail with two revolutionary soldiers. There would be only one execution today, but a crowd of over a thousand had already massed in the Place d'Alberta to chant their ghoulish curses and gloat. How he was beginning to hate the world and everyone in it. Perhaps this disillusionment was unsurprising, given his role, 
and the fact that although concealed by the sombre black beaked mask that supposedly granted him anonymity, everyone knew who Tombo was, partly because X was a small town and whispers scattered as readily as autumn leaves, mostly because he was six foot four in height and as broad as a wrestler, unmistakable due to the stooped posture he developed during a childhood polio bout. Children threw stones at him in the street and ran away. Widows muttered under their breath and clutched prayer beads whenever he passed. Even when he was with his wife Madeline and sons Maxime and Georges, he heard voices mocking him. Within minutes, the bruised, cowed and ragged figure of the printer stood before him. He had evidently soiled himself with fear and was shaking like a palsied whippet. Go on then, he shouted at the printer, who twisted his beard anxiously and began to cry, low and soft as if he feared being hurt. Tombeau couldn't quite find it in his heart to despise him. The man had a small book clutched in one hand, presumably his Bible, as he staggered up the stone corridor towards the bright arch of the doorway onto the street. As Tombeau and his men marched the printer to his doom, the taunting crowd's roar rose and fell like waves, accompanied by the whinnying of horses and the cries of hawkers, selling cheap wine and whatever mouldy loaves and cheese they could muster. Grain was scarcer than ever and bread prices soared weakly. Abruptly the soldiers stopped just before the sunlit portal. The printer had fallen to his knees and was clutching at the hem of one of the soldiers' jerkins. The officer kicked the miscreant away. The old man picked himself up and beseeched Tombeau instead, unfazed by the implacable raven's beak of his mask. Please, sir, I'm only a humble working man, a good servant of the Republic. I print everything, playbills, hymn books, even songs. I allow my clients privacy and control of their treatises. I do not concern myself with their content. Get on with you. You know what you've done, Tombo muttered, pushing the printer towards the light. I'll drag you there myself if I have to. Face your fate like a man. The printer seemed to gather himself together, his attempt at pleading having failed. He almost looked haughty as he replied huffily, I'm a righteous working man, a good man. The good man then turned and walked with surprising speed towards the square and his ending. He held out his manacled hands in supplication to the crowd as they either pelted him with rotting cabbages or cried, God be with you! This latter response to the executions had been building in recent weeks, almost as if some of the crowd were there to watch martyrs face their ends, not seditious traitors. The printer climbed the steps, sandwiched between the two soldiers as Tombo stopped to dip his hands into a small brass bowl of ground chalk held by a street urchin whose features were incongruously cherubic. Let me get this farce over with, thought Tombo, and then perhaps today is the day I resign. He rubbed in the chalk, making sure his hands would maintain a steady grip on the rope until the formalities were concluded. The sunlit square was fiercely bright after the gloom of the jail, and the smoke from the vendor's stalls blew an ashen pall across the cobbles, carrying with it a strange sweet smell, roasted hazelnuts and dried apricots. The smoke rendered everything grainy, unreal, like the way the world looks when you wake in the early morning in winter and your eyes have yet to adjust to the darkness. While one of the usual magistrates read the charges against the printer and asked him if he had anything to say, Tombeau reached down from the raised stage to snatch a handful of dried apricots and figs from a vendor's stall. The woman behind it nodded her assent, for who would dare to refuse the raven-faced man in charge of the oblique blade? The apricots were decidedly chewy, as if they'd been stored for too long. They began to stick to Tombo's teeth. He caught the tail end of the printer's last words, a courtesy of the town's magistrate had added as a recent innovation, in an attempt to inject an opportunity for redemption into the proceedings. It seldom worked as intended. Most of the victims either wept, remained rigidly silent, prayed, pissed themselves, or cursed their accusers violently. More than once Tombo had had to drop the blade mid-sentence to spare the women folk a choice expletive. And I hope we will weather these dark days and that sanity and kindness will prevail. I'm an innocent working man, not a counter-revolutionary. God be with you all. Whatever else the man had said while Tombo's thoughts had been drifting, he'd evidently lulled the crowd into an unusually mute state. No more missiles or curses were hurled, and an expectant hush fell as Tombo helped the printer out of his manacles, gently prized the Bible from his hand, and knelt him down upon the stock, placing his exposed nape over the well-smoothed wood, varnished with old blood. Tombeau lowered the upper stock to meet its kin, padlocking the printer into his final position, supplicant and prone. The executioner adjusted the position of the basket that would receive the victim's head. 
he ceremoniously ran a finger along the edge of the blade, just a little away from the cutting surface, then raised it to his lips as if injured. Utter theatre, all of it. The printer was saying something. He paused to listen. The old man swivelled in the stock to look at Tombow, whose eyes were the only aspect of his humanity on display. Look after my poems. You're a good man. Tombow frowned and looked down at the small book he'd taken from the printer. Not a Bible, after all, evidently. The old man's face looked almost beatific as he closed his eyes, nodded once and lowered his head. Tombow stood up and made as if to give the mechanism one final inspection. He could see the magistrate frowning at the edge of the stage, wondering what the delay was. The executioner made as if to inspect the rope, holding the blade in place, while, with his other hand, he surreptitiously jammed a fig into the groove in the wooden struts which directed the blade to its final destination. There was an archaic town statute which stated that a condemned man need only suffer three drops of the blade. If the mechanism failed three times, he would be pardoned, since God had evidently seen fit to intervene. There was once a time when nobody would think to argue with God's mercy. The anti-religionists were influential, but in X at least, the churches still held their services, and Tombeau had frequently seen the magistrate in attendance at the cathedral. At the appointed moment, the magistrate swept his hand horizontally in a gesture for both silence and justice. Tombeau unhooked the rope from its cleats and let it go. The blade dropped two feet, then jammed in place. A soft murmur rose from the crowd. Quickly, Tombeau stepped up to the scaffold, wound the blade up before anyone could examine the guillotine. The fig was half cut through. Tombeau couldn't risk a substitution. All eyes were upon him. He twisted the rope anxiously, then dropped the blade once more. Again the steel jammed, and this time the crowd gasped and whooped in amazement. Someone shouted, he has but one more chance. It wasn't clear whether the onlooker meant Tom Bow or his victim, but the magistrate waved his arms furiously for silence and scowled at, scowled at Tom Bow. What is wrong with you today, man? Are you entirely incompetent? Tom Bow bristled, but wound the blade up once more. The old man was weeping audibly, mewling like a cat. This was beyond cruel. Tombo was simply torturing him. He ought to clear the blade's channel and get this over with. A quick inspection revealed he didn't have to. The fig was gone, but its stalk had somehow wedged itself between the wood and the blade. When he lifted the steel this time, the stalk would fall away and the blade would be free to perform its duty. Tombo felt the panic of a conscience in crisis. He'd chosen this new path and would not easily be dissuaded, but he couldn't simply refuse to complete the task. There were four keen young apprentices just itching to step in. Tombeau could see two of them, Lawrence and Xavier, both scarcely 18, waiting by the side of the stage. He avoided their eyes. Finish him, the magistrate hissed, before adding piously, God willing. Tombeau raised one hand to his mouth as if stifling a cough. As he mimed a final blade check, he spat the half-masticated apricot into his hand and tried to quickly wedge it into the wooden groove. As he did so, he locked eyes with the magistrate. What in the name of hell? The magistrate crowd, striding over, his polished shoes clacking on the boards. He pushed Tombow back, leaning under the blade to examine the mechanism. With a look of vicious triumph, the magistrate ran his fingers up the wooden groove, his body off balance, seeking apricot residue to prove Tombow's treachery. It took only a tiny motion of Tombow's right foot and elbow to trip the magistrate, so that he fell forward across the scaffold. In the same instant, Tombow let go of the rope. The magistrate made the terrible but understandable mistake of twisting in position to arrest the blade with his hands as he heard it fall. The steel took off four fingers as it sliced down into the magistrate's arm and shoulder. There were screams and the crowd began to surge in all directions. Soldiers ran to prevent the crowd from ascending the steps, while Tombo moved fast to lift the blade from the screaming magistrate, whose arm was sliced open like a side of pork, a bloody chunk of forearm sliding down the bald pate of the printer beneath him, who was shaking but oddly silent. Tombo raised the blade, tied it off, and with the aid of one of the soldiers, carried the now unconscious magistrate off the scaffold. While the soldier and others were attending to the magistrate, Tombo lifted the stocks, grabbed the printer, and pulled him back onto his haunches. Go! Go now! he hissed from under the bird mask. The printer seemed lost in an uncomprehending reverie. Perhaps he thought he had died and this was hell. Tombow realised he was soaking in blood and heard someone call his name angrily. He knew that tone. He would be next on the scaffold. Go! On with you! Godspeed! 
he shouted at the face of the printer, who seemed to snap out of his trance as two waiting young men pulled him down from the stage. They looked familiar. Perhaps they were his sons. Whoever they were, they threw a blanket over his head and the crowd seemed to open and close like a pair of curtains, concealing the printer, while soldiers attempted to push through the unruly, crazed, screaming, weeping, laughing crowd. Tombeau felt a hand grasp him roughly by the shoulder, a military grip. He ignored it. He wanted to watch the printer vanish out of the square with his sons. He wanted to feel he had done the right thing. He wanted vindication. He wanted to wash his hands, literally and figuratively, of the whole squalid scene. When the blow came that knocked him unconscious, Tombo welcomed it, even as his legs folded beneath him and the raven's mask smashed and scattered black fragments across the blood-soaked boards. Thank you. So yeah, I had a lot of fun writing that one. Um, and I could see the whole scene very vividly. Um, I can see how it would be staged. I can see the characters. So, I mean, if I was ever going to direct a short film of one of my stories, that's a good contender. Although, period costume, guillotines, yeah, crowds, France might not be possible. We'll see. Anyway, just a thought. If anyone, any producers watching this, want to option such an idea, go ahead. Anyway, I enjoyed writing that, and um, I'll see you again for story number 94. Goodbye.